the stuff I want to share with you actually meets one of my needs. You might pick it up as we go. Um, when I was working at MLC and I'd come home from a frazzled kind of day, I'd call in to see my friend Wendy, who has since died and who I loved dearly. And I, I did her funeral, which was a big ask. And I had known her like 30 years. And I used to call in and have a coffee before I would go home. And she'd say, well, what you need to do, I say this with no disrespect to her, what you need to do is go home, put on a worship CD, and worship the Lord. Okay? So Simon and Cherie are nodding their heads, and Trav's probably nodding his head, and I would go home, and I had three teenagers, and I was on my own. So I'd do dinner, and I'd unpack my stuff, and we'd clean up, and, you know, talk, or whatever was happening in the house referee, you know, whatever was happening in a house with a single mum and three teenagers. And then I would sit down at my desk and study. And this was actually before I was at MLC, it was when I was doing theology. And so then I'd study and I'd work on the latest essay or assignment or, you know, whatever, read books, you know. And then I'd finish, and it was like, oh, bedtime, have a shower, go to bed. And there's a lot of guilt, because I did not put on a CD, and I did not worship the Lord, and I'd feel really bad. So when I discovered um, Gary Thomas's work on Sacred Pathways, which you can find online and do a little quiz. But I think with the work we're going to do today, you'll probably be able to sort it out without the quiz. Um, I found this work very liberating. I find those sort, you know, the strength finders, the personality tests, all that sort of thing, I find those things liberating. A lot of people find them confining. I don't want to be defined by that. I find it's just the reverse. For me, it explains a lot about who I am. For me, it is confirmation of who I am. So you can find this online. Gary Thomas, Sacred Pathways. He writes about nine. Bill Hybels has also written it. He's written about 11. Rob and I use Gary Thomas's work, except that we've made it 10. So you've got our little bit of wisdom tacked on to Gary Thomas. Okay, the first sacred pathway. A sacred pathway is how you connect to God. I see that as how can I help, not that I need to, but what do I do to help me be filled with Holy Spirit? Okay? A naturalist. This is not the person who goes to a camp with another word that starts with N. Okay? A naturalist. This is seeing cathedrals. This is seeing the kingdom of God, not in pews, but in the bush, or on the beach, or sitting by a running river, or a babbling brook, and, or the desert. It's finding God in nature. It is not worshiping nature. It is not worshiping the creation, but the creator. Okay, so everything you see just reminds you of God. On our trip to the States recently, the green, the green in the U.S. is amazing. 
everywhere there was green. I mean green, green. I've written about green. I look out there and I see green on the oval. But where we were in Georgia and Pennsylvania, the green was also vertical. The trees are green. They're not gray green, blue green, silver green, red green, yellow green, blue green. They're green. We drove 3,200 Ks in three weeks. And I sat in the car and soaked up God in the green and in the creation. It was absolutely wonderful. Um, so, um, if you are that kind of person, you might want to take your Bible outside and read it. Not today, no. You might want to get up at dawn and worship God as the sun rises. Not today. Going for a walk. And, you know, anything that takes you out of doors. Um, can I tell your story, Jenny? <laughs> Jenny was at the beach one day, and, you, and she felt like she was wasting time or something, but it was a real blessing and just really filled her. And I'm sharing this with her permission. It filled her. I believe that experience filled her with Holy Spirit. Put me on the beach in July in Australia at Mornington with the wind and the rain, and I am so close to God, you can't believe it. Right? Right? I can see some people nodding and some people, <laughs> okay? But that's what works. And, and Jenny has said, oh, I felt like I wasted all my day. And I couldn't wait to tell her that in fact that time was a time when she was being refilled with Holy Spirit. You might be a naturalist. Traditionalists, I don't think there are many of us here. I don't think I'll see many heads nodding. You like ritual and symbols and banners on the wall and the sacraments and structure, okay? Because all of those things work for you. I mean, we, most of us, I think, would find that pretty hard to imagine. But for some people, Traditional, traditional works. So that person might read scripture aloud or say a psalm every morning or every night aloud or follow the church calendar. I have to admit, I have said on occasion that one thing I miss about YVV is, I miss in YVV, is that we don't always follow the church calendar. So really significant days, Ascension Day or Pentecost, these really significant days come and go, and because of YVV being YVV, they hardly rate a mention. And that is one thing I miss. It isn't enough to take me elsewhere, but, um, it's the only thing I miss out of a traditional church, probably. But for some people, traditional really works. Um, okay? Activists. Now, you might be an activist. Although, I think because of our move from Cave Hill, a lot of our activists have left. I actually, because they're not able to activate. Um, I see, I'm a Uniting Church minister, I see the Uniting Church as an activist kind of church, like the whole thing. So if you're not an activist, it's kind of hard to fit in sometimes, okay? Activists serve a God of justice. That will be a word you'll hear. You'll hear about the cleansing of the temple. You'll hear about standing against evil. And you'll hear about getting sinners to repent. And 
they enjoy interaction with other people, even if it's conflict, rather than being a loner in a small group. So activists can be spiritually activated by being in the battle. Okay? Um, they might be in marches or protests or being writing letters to important people in the government. All right, and this recharges them. This is an exercise for them of Holy Spirit, and it's filling with Holy Spirit. Okay, I've got the wrong order. Are you keeping up with my mistakes? Vanessa, yes, great. Thank you. We'll go back to number two. Sensates are people, see if you're this kind of person, who get totally lost in the beauty and splendor of God. You want to be filled with sights and sounds and smells. You want incense and architecture and classical music and a formal language. And this sends your spirit. It really connects you to Holy Spirit, and Holy Spirit is able to fill you. You might enjoy walking the Stations of the Cross or, or using incense. You know, if I go to a church with smells and bells, I don't walk out filled with Holy Spirit. I walk out sneezing and sniffling, you know. It, it doesn't work for me. So you might enjoy soaking. I can remember when everybody was telling me to soak in the Lord. So put some music on and lie down on the floor and just soak up the Lord. And I'm like, what? I couldn't do that. You might create a worship place just for you to go and worship the Lord in a closet. Okay, caregivers. I think we have a lot of them still. Caregivers love God, serve God, get filled up by God by serving other people. They, uh, caregivers see Christ in the poor. They see Christ in the needy. And their faith is built up. They're filled with Holy Spirit by interacting with other people. Mother Teresa said, quote, Giving care isn't a chore, but a form of worship. Okay? Acts of mercy, very practical ways. Caregiving is not about judging other people, the poor and the needy, or the person you meet on the street. It's just serving God in a different way. So you, a caregiver, might adopt someone. I don't count myself as a really good caregiver, but we had a young woman live with us for a while when she needed that space, so we did a little bit of caregiving. But, um, you know, you might adopt someone. I have a few extra daughters um, that I care for. You might help a, at a crisis pregnancy place or whatever. You might work in the inner city. Okay, you might work in a soup kitchen. You might work in an op shop. Right? Caregivers. Okay, let me see. Traditional sensates. Oh, I've lost my place. We've done sensates, ascetics. You want to be left alone in prayer. Don't disturb me. I don't need pictures. I'm not saying me, I mean, if you're this person. I don't need pictures, I don't need smells, I don't need bells, I don't need music, just leave me alone, I wanna pray. And you're, uncomfort you're actually uncomfortable in an environment where you can't listen to the quiet. Holy Spirit often whispers, doesn't he? 
really annoying, but he does often whisper. So, if you're an ascetic, you might need to worship in the quiet of the night. You might be the 3 a.m. person, or get up early in the morning, or fast, or practice silence, looking for ways to simplify your life. So, uh, an introvert would probably be more inclined to be that sort of person than an extrovert. But an extrovert might be energized a little bit and come closer to Holy Spirit through those times. But I think it would be more um, an introvert. Okay, enthusiasts. A lot of people think I'm an enthusiast. All right. Well, I sort of am. You get really excited about worship and joyful celebration. And you love to clap your, clap your hands and shout an amen and go woohoo uh, and dance in your excitement. All right? An enthusiast. Um, it can, if it's shallow, not work so well, really. Um, it needs to be genuine. But I'm saying that as a person who is not an enthusiast. <laughs> so you don't want it to be trivial. An enthusiast would want to keep track of his or her dreams and write them down and talk with someone about them. They'd spend time just listening to God and writing down what you hear. And enthusiasts are expectant. They're waiting for God to do something. Contemplatives. Contemplatives might refer to God as their lover. Okay? And the focus isn't necessarily on serving God or doing his will or doing great things, but just simply obeying him. If he says do X, do X. If he says do Y, you do Y. And it's like a um, contemplative, like spending time just holding hands with God. And it's a really pure, deep love that a contemplative shares with the Lord. So there might be secret acts of devotion, and, or you do something for someone and nobody else in the whole world knows. Um, you might do a centering kind of prayer where you choose a word and you just focus on it. Okay, not a whole lot of happening, but a focus and a meditative kind of prayer. Um, I think Paul might have been a contemplative kind of person. I think he spent a lot of time uh, with the Lord listening and being still. Okay? Intellectuals love God with their mind. They like to be studying. They like to study weird topics like predestination and the ordination of women and infant baptism and all that sort of exciting stuff. And understanding something new about God is like, wow, this is so great. God is so amazing. I just adore him. And intellectuals remind us of the high calling of loving God with our mind. That's not bad. A lot of people thinking, oh, he's too intellectual. I think Paul was an intellectual. A lot of people think, oh, being intellectual is bad. No, he tells us, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and well, we're to use our minds. He's given them to us. He's given us the brains. So um, the Levites didn't have to do the duties that everybody else did because they were involved in study. Okay? So if you're this kind of person, you might want to do some study or um, you know, there are online studies, you know, that Proverbs 31, 
that you're doing, or you might want to do study a course somewhere. Not to get a degree or anything, but just because using your mind brings you closer to God. I have a quote in the laundry of all places, and oh, maybe it was Spurgeon. I was going to bring it today. Don't go into your office to prepare a sermon. Go into your office to get close to God. Then you write what he said. I don't know if that's not the exact quote, and I don't know if it was him or not. So you might want to do some theology, etc. And the tenth one that Rob and I have added is relational. You love God by being with others in conversation. Okay, I love this. This is one of mine. You have more than one. And I think age and stage makes a difference. If you're a contemplative and you have three children under four, forget it, right? So age and stage works, but a cappuccino and conversation for me fills me with God. It fills me with Holy Spirit. You know, it's not, I'm not talking chit-chat conversations. I'm talking deeper conversations. So we've added that one. That may be one of yours, okay? I think we probably all have three or four age and stage related. And I think it's great that we have more than one because when the age and stage interferes, we can, you know, use others. And just two things I want to say, three. One, don't should people. Don't should people. You should go home and put on a CD and worship the Lord. What? No, that was great for her, wonderful for her. She was a beautiful woman of God, not for me, okay? So don't should people. And don't assume that what works for you is going to work for somebody else. Right? So advice giving is out. I have been blessed by preparing for today because I had to use my mind. So thank you for listening. You have helped me be filled with Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you.